الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه. الحمد لله. إن شاء الله we continue سورة النساء. I'm reading سورة النساء from ayah 32. We'll see if we have time to get to the controversial ayah ayah 34 that has been people have been asking me for the past few days. When is when am I going to get to ayah 34 in time? In time. The ayah, the ayah 32, is an interesting ayah. It's a continuation from um, how we deal with our wealth. When Allah started this discussion in ayah 29, Allah says, لا تأكلوا أموالكم بين كل باطل. And then Allah mentioned, ولا تأكلوا أنفسكم. Do not kill yourself over trade, over businesses, over wealth. So now, in the ayah that we are reading today, how is that? What is this ayah? In the ayah that we are reading, we're going to be reading today. وَلَا تَتَمَنَّوْا مَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بِهِ بَعْضَكُمْ عَلَى بَعْضٍ Allah says, do not wish for what Allah has favored some others over the others. So Allah says, وَلَا تَتَمَنَّوْا مَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بِهِ بَعْضَكُمْ عَلَى بَعْضٍ لِلْرِجَالِ نَصِيبٌ مِّمَّا كَسَبُوا وَلِلْنِسَاءِ نَصِيبٌ مِّمَّا كَسَبُوا That the man will get what he works for, he will earn what he worked for, and for the women, they will earn what they will for. So that there will be share for each man and woman. And Allah says, وَلَا تَتَمَنَّوْ مَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ That certain people that Allah would give them certain things better than others, certain others will be lesser than others. So that is part of human life. Imam Al-Raghib Al-Isfahani, in his, uh, one of his books, Imam Al-Raghib Al-Isfahani um, passed away 400 something Hijrah. He and Imam Al-Ghazali probably um, the years between his born, his birth, his death and Imam Al-Ghazali's birth is not that far. But Imam Al-Ghazali is very much attached to the books of Imam uh, Al-Raghib Al-Isfahani to the point that one of the books of Imam Al-Raghib Al-Isfahani, al dariya they say that Imam Al-Ghazali would not go around traveling without al dariya He would always carry that book despite him memorizing uh, the book already uh, by Rumi. But Raja al-Sfahari, in one of his books, he mentioned about that the Ummah will always be in the state of good as long as there is no equality. When there is equality, then you will see destruction. Now, now this doesn't sound politically correct. Today, everybody wants to be equal. What he means is equality like communism. Everybody is equally rich. Everybody is equally poor. As long as you have that, then you will read mediocrity. You will never have excellence. I was, alhamdulillah, one of the first few foreigners allowed to enter Vietnam, Hanoi, when they opened up in 1992. Um, Vietnam, South and Northern Vietnam, they, they, they were under the same government, but slightly different administration style. Ho Chi Minh, Southern Vietnam was always open because they were under America for a long time. Hanoi was always under the Viet Cong and the communists, and they were closed, they didn't allow foreigners. 1992, they wanted to enter to ASEAN, uh, they allowed, and, and um, our prime, Malaysian Prime Minister at that time was keen to get Vietnam on board, um, ask Malaysian businesses to open up offices in Hanoi, and one of them was Malaysia Airlines, and my father was there. So you will see that, and I, 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 I got a glimpse of what it was like uh, in a communist uh, country. Whether you're a doctor or you're a cleaner, you get paid the same. At the end of the day, it's a headcount. You've got ration based on how many children you have, you have one wife, you have three children, so you get paid for yourself and whatever ration for your family. And then someone else who may be excellent, who may be brilliant, but doesn't have children, will be paid the same, uh, lesser than someone who has not worked. So what it breeds, it breeds mediocrity. Nobody wants to work extra hard because what's the point? You will still gain the same, uh, the same amount, whether you sit at home. You're not allowed to sit at home. You have to go out and work. But what's the point of studying hard? What's the point of being brilliant if you're, there is no motivation to actually excel. So you remember Allah was funny, he said that if you see that, you see absolute equality, that is, a, that is the starting point of destruction in society. And now we're seeing that in the, uh, in the Western civilization. They don't call it communism, but you cannot, you cannot reward students that are excellent some, in some places now because for fear of hurting those who do not get awarded. So students who score exams, they do well. Oh, you can't give them a award because if you give them a award, you have to give to all the children. But not all the children do well in exams. What about those who don't do well? Well, 
that is life. Whether they learn it now or they learn it later, they will have to learn it eventually that life in this world will never be absolutely fair and um, equal. So, uh, and I think even now when it comes to um, health related things, there are certain words that you cannot use. Um, they're removing certain words from even previous books. Uh, the word like fat, uh, the word like ugly, uh, they're removing uh, those words from uh, older books. Because everybody is equally pretty, everybody is equally beautiful, whether everybody is equally healthy, whether you are 180 kilos or you're 80 kilos, you're equally, uh, you're equally, equally healthy. It's not politically correct to, 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 to um, tell the person that you're leading an unhealthy lifestyle and so on. Well, we know, if, if this continues, we know where we are um, heading. So Allah said that He has created, that, that the way He created humanity and He created life in this, in this world, it is not meant to be absolutely equal. There are certain people that Allah gives certain strength, others are given other strength, so we work with each other and we complement each other. Now some people will say, yes, there's no equality in this world, we'll get equality in Jannah. No, no, even in Jannah there's no equality. There are people in Jannah to Firdaus, there are people in the second level, third level, and, and, and so on. There are different categories of people in Jannah. It's the same in Jahannam. Not everybody will be punished the same. There will always be category. It's the nature of, uh, of, of uh, the world and us. That's how Allah has created us. So Allah says, do not desire do not wish for what Allah has given others. And some people, uh, and Allah says, men, this is between in relation to men and women, and we see this gender, um, uh, this, uh, gender friction and, and crisis today between men and women. It started with the feminist movement wanting what men want, what, what men had, and now it's blurring the line between what and what is men and what is uh, women, whatever that you identify your gender as, then that, 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 that's what it is. And it's eroding the women's right that the West have been fighting for so long. And we see that in certain sports, the champion today are um, transgender people, uh, men who've been competing in the male category and couldn't succeed, and then let's go in. Let's, let's identify as women and compete with the women. And I think in one of the MMA matches, um, uh, uh, men who've been losing in the male category identify as a woman and goes fight into the women category and actually severely uh, damage um, the, the, the skull of one of his her competitor uh, opponent because just sheer muscle and bone density is different. So what this mess comes from the when you're not happy with what Allah has given you. In Buddhism, we have this concept that, that they have this concept that the root of evil is desire. And uh, there is a multi-step program that you follow in Buddhism to eliminate desire. Islam, on the other hand, does not tell us to eliminate desire. Islam recognizes that human is created with desire. We, we, we discussed this, I think, two nights ago about shahwat. Islam recognizes it. Islam just put rules and regulations around it so that your desire do not take over your intellect, do not take over your entire life. So you can wish for something, you can want for something within bounds of the Sharia. There are certain things that you may want, but you should not get it because it is halal. There may be things that you want, it's halal, but the means to getting it may be haram. So let it be. And now this ayah is beautiful in the context of how the society is moving today. Allah is saying that men and women are not created the same. They are equal spiritually before Allah. When you pray to Raka'ah, a man praying to Raka'ah will be rewarded by Allah the same as the women pray to Raka'ah based on their ikhlas, their sincerity and so on. But their function on earth should not be the same. There are certain things that are more masculine in nature. There are certain things that are more feminine in nature. No matter what, no matter what the men do, no matter what the men feel like, identify his gender as he can never get pregnant. That is a role specifically for women. No matter what the men do, he can never get Jannah 
under his feet because he can never be a mother. That role is specifically only for women. Although today they say that pregnant women is a politically incorrect statement, you have to use people who are capable of pregnancy, something like that. Uh, because uh, because they, 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 can, they categorize trans men, meaning women who turn to become men, as men when they are capable of pregnancy. So you should not say women who are capable of pregnancy, it should be people on the inner level. Um, and there was a circular being, being distributed, I think a few years ago, uh, to some unis, that you should not use father and mother uh, as phrase anymore, because not everybody has father and mother, some people have father and father, some mother and mother, and it should not be um, breastfeeding, it should be something else as another term uh, used. So this is all coming from, the root is, Women wanting to be men, men wanting to be women, they do not realize the, that Allah has placed them on earth with a specific responsibility, specific roles we, we do as, we, as, as Allah has commanded us to do. Um, and وَاسْأَلُ اللَّهَ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ And ask for Allah for His fadl. Now fadl is bonus, extra from whatever that you have. And ajr is what you earn, fadl is extra beyond that. Yes, fadl. Yes, there is a there is Now, we enter Jannah not just with the soul. We are resurrected with our body. So we enter Jannah as men and women. Because we know that husbands and wives will still be together in Jannah. You will be resurrected with the person that you love. And if the husband loves the wife, wife loves the husband, loves the husband will be resurrected together. If they don't love each other, they stay just for the sake of convenience. Uh, maybe they don't want to suffer in eternity in Jannah. Uh, Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think uh, he was talking about uh, how robotics blending with uh, organic life and um, uh, Elon Musk is big on that, trying to transplant a chip into our brain. Uh, but I think uh, FBA stopped the experiment. Uh, he, wanted, he said that it was ready for human, human trial. So plant in the internet directly, plug it into your brain. How do that? We don't need Qur'an anymore. Everybody is a hawker. Just download the Qur'an and then... <laughs> وَاسْأَلُ اللَّهَ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمًا Allah, indeed, Allah is uh, most knowledgeable over everything. وَلِكُلِّ جَعَلْنَا مَوَالِيَ مِمَّا تَرَكَ الْوَالِدَانِ وَالْأَقْرَبُونَ And Allah says, for every, for, every, for every person, Allah has made mawali. Mawali here, uh, Ibn Abbas, he translated as Al-Asara. Uh, These are your close family members that inherit that everyone will have family members who will inherit from their parents. Then some people that you have promised from those inheritors, that you say that, you know, you may have a good friend and you say that well, if my father passes away and I get this and this amount, I'll give you a certain amount of money and so on. And then um, that happens. From the inheritance, you have to pass it, and you, whatever that you have promised, you have to give to the people that you have promised. In Allah, indeed, Allah is um, witnessing over everything, over all your promises, over the way you distributed, you distribute your um, your inheritance. الرجال قوامون على النساء بما فضل الله بعضهم على بعض وبما أنفقوا من أموالهم. Now this ayah is controversial because this is the ayah that contains the phrase where it says that um, if your wife disobeys you, then beat your wife. We're going, to, we're going to go and look into the meaning of this ayah, does Islam allow men to beat their wife? Now first of all, Allah starts this ayah by saying, Ar-rijalu qawwamun ala nisa. Men are qawwamun ala nisa. What is the meaning of qawwam? Now you see al-qawwam is a hyperbolic form of Qayyum. When Allah says uh, He is the Qayyum of Samawati wal Ard, means He is the sustainer. 
He protects, he created the universe that is his Khalid. Qayyum means he continues to sustain the universe and he protects the universe. He provides for the, for, for, for the inhabitants of the universe. When Allah says that here it means that men are the sustainer and protector and provider for the women. When you marry your, uh, you marry your wife, you are responsible to feed her, to shelter, provide a roof over her head, to provide clothes for her to uh, wear. Now, this is a point of contention and some, uh, sometimes my wife and I, when we see some, uh, I don't, uh, by saying this, uh, if you get, if generally when, when, when couples come from, we don't do couples therapy, uh, we deal with children, but um, just part of the um, uh, side effects of our job with children, we do see uh, problematic uh, couples sometimes, we, generally we will tai chi to other people, but some uh, that we see, um, they argue about this concept of nafqa, the husband being the tawwab, being the provider, sustainer, so the wife now wants this, that, and this, and that, and say that. They break it down, they say that, oh, the husband is not providing, um, what it means, because uh, the, despite the husband putting a roof over her head, giving her food, clothing, and so on, but because the wife is not working, she wants a monthly allowance, like an hourly rate for looking after the children and so on and so forth. So is that a requirement? What is the fifthly requirement, re uh, responsibilities of the husband towards the wife? Now, bear in mind that if you have to take it down to the minimum fifthly requirement, your marriage is already doomed. Because the minimum fifthly requirement there is actually just as a safeguard. This is not the requirement for a successful marriage. This is just safeguard so that the marriage doesn't break down. But if this is what you're fighting about, something is really wrong somewhere. The minimum requirement, if you look into fifth books, is that you need a house or that where the wife can, con has control over that, 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 that's a space, comfortable space, safe space, where the wife has control within that area. That means if the wife wants to move the furniture from one point to another point, redo, not, not renovate, renovating in Australia takes forever. This is just you want to move the fridge from point A to point B. She has absolute right, right to do it. No one can tell her she's wrong. Now, problem happens when the husband marries the wife and brings the wife into her, his parents' house. Now the wife said, I want to move that, no, nah, no, nah, the fridge shouldn't be there, the TV shouldn't be there. There will be conflict between the wife and the in-laws. And this is why the Prophet wasallam said to men who, who wants to bring the wife to live with the in-laws, he, he said that why are you playing with fire? Because you're not fulfilling the responsibility of providing shelter. Does it need to be luxurious house? Does it need to be uh, beautiful furniture? No. But she must have control over that space. Simple space, she, she can have it. Uh, simple space, let's say, based on ma'roof, based on the income of the husband. If the husband has very low income, all she can afford for uh, sitting for chairs is uh, milk crates and a cushion on top of it. As long as the wife has full control over where those things are placed, he meets the fifth requirement. But again, when it comes to marriage, remember, al ma'roof, what is customarily accepted within the socio-economic uh, community that you are living in. That is um, house. And then you need food. Food, if you look into the discussions, books, they will say that two meals a day, what she is customarily eating before marriage. So if you are Indonesian who eats rice for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and everything in between, you marry into someone who eats bread, for instance, who Egyptian, whose definition for bread is ish, is life, then you feed your wife rice, that doesn't fulfill the requirement. You need to feed the staple food that she is accustomed to before marriage. If she is happy to adopt Indonesian culture and eat rice, that's okay. But if she is not, you have to provide what she is accustomed to. Does that mean it has to be a five-star buffet? No. Two meals a day, what she, staple food that she from her customer. Clothings, two clothings, 
a year for Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. Basically two clothings a year. Anything beyond that is charity on behalf of the husband. So if you're fighting at this point, you're fighting over nafta, it, the, barrier is, the barrier is so low. You're complaining that the husband's not providing. There are many other things. That is, there's a lot of other problems beyond nafta. Nafta is just the symptoms. There is an iceberg of problem underneath it. So Allah starts the discussion about responsibility between husbands and wives. Allah says, Ar-rijalu qawwamuna ala nisa The men are made to be the protector, made to be the provider of the women. And protect her means you protect her from harm, you protect her spiritually, uh, you protect her physically from harm, you also protect her deen, protect her spiritually, make sure that she knows her deen, she's practicing her deen, teach her in terms of religion as well. بِمَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بِمَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بَعْضَهُمْ عَلَى بَعْضُ وَبِمَا أَنْفَقُوا مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ Now, with the position of Qawwam, you also, it also comes with leadership. There must be organizational structure in the household. Again, Allah has said, وَلَا تَتَمَنَّوا مَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ Do not wish for absolute equality. That will never happen. You cannot have a house where both husbands and wives share the same power, where there is no leadership within a household. Just like within a country, you cannot have two prime ministers. Within a company, you cannot have Two CEOs, although some companies did, BlackBerry had co CEOs, but that we know where BlackBerry is today. Most young people know BlackBerry as a food rather than as a tech uh, company. You know, oh, you know. <laughs> So, but generally you need one clear leadership. So, Allah says the leader is the husband, because they have spent money. Or so we can spend their wealth for the family. Now, maybe not maybe people today don't like this kind of statement saying that what do you mean, man, husband is the, the, the leader, wife is the power. This is just how Allah has structured family. And you see that for as long as you keep the structure, generally marriages will be more successful than uh, the divorce rate will be lower. Uh, this concept of leadership, does that mean absolute obedience from the wife to the husband? I'd like to share one story about Sayyidina Umar al Khattab. Now, Umar al Khattab, we all know who he is. He is a giant, physically big, um, very strong person, very known to be a um, fierce character. One day, when he was, when he was studying, um, one day a man one came to Umar al Khattab wanted to complain to Umar al Khattab about his wife. His wife was non-stop you know, talking and scolding the husband. So he, he, he was tired of it. He said, I'm, I can't take this anymore, I'm going to report to the Khalifa. He got to Umar's house. Umar lived in a small house. And he was hearing Umar was being scolded by his wife. And then he knocked on the door, but he heard the scolding, he left. And Omar, after being scolded by the wife, he, he, he chased after the man and said, um, do you need something from me? And the man said, yeah, yeah. I wanted to complain to you about my wife, but apparently you've been scolded by your wife as well. And Omar, and Omar said, why shouldn't I be patient with her? She cooks for me, she looks after my children, she looks after my house. This scolding is temporary, I can just be, be patient, listen to her, and then things will get back to normal. So it is, some husbands, they, they use this ayah, the yellow mawabun ala nisa, the moment the wife raises his, her, her voice, you go like, stop Allah Azeem, or the yellow mawabun ala nisa, you're going to Jahannam because you raise my voice. The wife of Umar raised his voice with um, Umar bin Khattab, raised her voice with Umar bin Khattab. The wife of the prophets would speak back, to talk back to uh, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Say that the Hafsa was told off by uh, Sayyidina Umar, her, her father. So Hafsa, why do you talk back to the Prophet? And Hafsa said, all the wives did that. The Prophet was tolerant. If anyone else were to do that to the Prophet, it would have been a major sin. It would, have been, it would lead to kufr for talking back to the Prophet. Yet the wives of the Prophet, when they talk back to the Prophet Allah let it slide. Because it is, it is the nature of 
husband and wife relationship, you are going to get into argument. There will be disagreements. Do not use this ayah as your ammo, man. Do not use this ayah, the only ayah in the Quran that I've memorized. Do not use this as your weapon against your wife. The relationship, there is leadership, but there is also room for discussions and disagreement. I'll, I'll continue this ayah tomorrow, but I'll end with this uh, incident with Umar al-Khattab again. This, um, I find Umar al-Khattab's relationship with his wife interesting. Um, Umar al-Khattab had a wife, young wife, very beautiful lady. Uh, and Umar became jealous because if when the wife leaves the house, people look at her, she's so pretty. So she only goes out to go to the masjid. Umar al-Khattab said, why don't you not go to the masjid? And the wife said, no, I'm still going to the masjid. Do not stop the women from going to the masjid. So the wife continued going to the masjid. Umar was like, how am I stop her from going to the masjid? One night, as the wife was leaving the house, Umar hit behind something, the rocks and bushes, and actually threw pebbles in the direction of the wife, hoping to scare the wife and the wife would go back uh, home. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the wife probably inherited some of the character of Umar al-Khattab, so she is not afraid of just 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 pebbles. Um, but this incident is sometimes used by some people to say, "See, Umar disliked women from going to the masjid. She threw he threw rocks to women that go to the masjid. He threw pebbles to his wife, not big rocks, just pebbles, small pebbles, to scare the wife away from the masjid out of jealousy rather than out of." Um, of permission from women coming to the masjid. Inshallah, we continue this ayah tomorrow. Barakallahu wa barakatuhu 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 wa barakatu